Okay, please take, please take your seats, everybody. We're going to get started with the next session. We already have Minister Silvi Duran from Costa Rica with us. Uh, thank you very much for joining us from afar via video. I hope you can see us well, and uh, we are very pleased to have you here, um, or to have you with us, even if not physically here, but here by video. You can hear us well? Yes, very well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm you sharing my screen. Is that working for you? The, the screen is... Uh, we, the, the face could be a bit more central to the picture, actually. Okay, um, let me see. So if you can get the camera a bit uh, higher up, yeah. that is wonderful. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, this session is called Cultural and Academic Ties, and I think it's um, important for us that um, we have got this panel. This is an as it's called, um, EU LAC Economic Forum. Um, mm -hmm. But we certainly have to understand that cultural and academic ties are not kind of a decorative element we can put on top, but that they are really at the very heart of um, the bi-regional relationship we have with Latin America. And I think there's actually more to it. We've got this famous uh, quote by... Bill Clinton, which I think everybody remembers, it's the economy, stupid. And we have had to learn that this was a way to narrow definition to understand politics. We've seen a comeback of identity politics as much in Europe as in Latin America. We've seen that cultural or social issues um, like gender, like same-sex marriage, if we think of Costa Rica recently, have become have come to very much to the fore of politics with a lot of effects on the political system, but also on the supranational system, where we've got a sense of, perhaps a manipulated sense of this take-back control issue, which we have seen with the Brexit, but which we see in a lot of the new uh, um, challenging movements um, that are challenging the multinational institutions, supranational institutions and much of the uh, values we built around them. So if uh, we come to this question we had earlier uh, that Latin America and the Caribbean is part of the West, we also really have to think what does it mean, the West, and I think culture and academic ties really are a part where this is very key because that is, I think we have got acoustic. Is that what you okay? Uh, Ambassador, uh, the um, technical staff tells me that you should mute the your microphone at present, but. Okay, um, so without further ado, um, I give you the word and I say a bit more what I was going to say afterwards, just as an intro to the, to the panel. Um, dear uh, Minister Sylvie Duran, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank the invitation of all the organizers and their effort to make me be with you through distance. And I... I would like to share some issues inspired on the fact that I work in management of public policy and cultural institutions rather than focusing on a more academic or research approach. Um, because I believe that one of the ways to increase cultural and academic benefits has to do directly uh, with our ability to interwine processes of knowledge, research, prototyping uh, with the management processes so we can eventually develop more smart or learning organizations um, in Latin America, I think, uh, for most of our countries. The pace uh, in which we can uh, actualize our um, 
institutions is not that fast. And now with all the changes in environment and technology, uh, that's a huge challenge. As you said before, the, the cultural cooperation between Europe and Latin America has been really important with many countries and the European Union as uh, leaders, um, but also in a way uh, where we cannot erase some hierarchical uh, relations that are, are part of our global system. So I would like to share some systemic thinking, some diagrams and metaphors we've been using for our work as ministry for the last three years. Some of them born many years ago when I worked as a more as a cultural activist, trying to enhance dialogue between civil society and governmental institutions uh, locally, but also between cooperation institutions and local agents, and between research and cultural action. Uh, in some of our countries, these uh, relations between academy, research, and the world of organization, governmental organizations, is not that fluent and we tend to look through different uh, places and sometimes uh, just for our uh, political uh, reality, uh, many times this relation has been, hasn't been as uh, productive and uh, close as we needed. My perspective is born then from a small scale country, Costa Rica, belonging to what was designed third world until some years ago, then developing country more recently, but also it's a very special country. We invest, invested in education, environment, peace, cultural and democratic institution in a very peculiar way for our region. Finally, my two, uh, one of my two core concerns how to do, have to do with how do you keep alive and strong small identities in global times and how can you take care and promote the evolution of our institutionality, so it remains pertinent regarding the current innovative and global challenge, challenges. Without real survival of small scale initiatives and realities, diversity and cultural rights are really endangered. So economic and political goals make sense to me as is synonymous of sustainable and co-responsible existence and as a, an effort to empower the more peripheral countries and realities. Even maybe I'm using some old fashioned words like periphery or a third world, but the truth is that those concepts still make sense to explain some of our unbalances, tensions and possibilities. So I'm going to share my, uh, uh, my screen. Can you see the presentation? Hello? Is uh, the presentation... Question to uh, the technical staff. Can we see the presentation? Is that working? Not yet. Let's... She's sharing. You, well, I give you the technical staff that can perhaps help you to set it up. So, Sylvie, remember, like, you have to share your screen. So, I see something. There's a... Sm yeah. No, it's us. So... There should be a button to share your screen. Let me check. It should be working now, isn't it? No. Let me check that way. It worked last now, time. Now is this working? Still not. Yeah. Wait, let me check my colleague knows this is the better one. We did it last time. Mm. We're trying to get this resolved. Let's um, ask everyone to be patient for, for a minute, perhaps. Um, it worked mm -hmm. the last time. Um, if yes. You, no, something has changed. That was perhaps helpful. I give it back to the IT team. Uh huh. So you're pressing the green button that says share screen, right? Yes. 
and nothing happens or nothing happens mm. and what, what oh no, no. no. okay <laughs> okay so now it's working be before the, your presentation we had a panel on digitization <laughs> and uh, i'm very happy that we don't fail to uh, uh, deliver the digital contact we have established with you um so i pass it Back to you. Um, yes, we see perfectly well now your screen. We also see you. Um, so okay. please go go ahead. Well, um, one of the first things that when I speak about small scale um, has to do with uh, a country of four or five millions of uh, population. Uh, when we talk about the other countries in the in Latin America, uh, it's really a challenge because. All Colombia is just like all Central America. We are smaller than Medellin or Antioquia in Colombia, or um, as you can see, we're between Ecuador and Cali. So when you, you talk about economic uh, challenges or um, representations in the regional uh, agenda, uh, we have to deal with this smallness of ourselves. So. Um, I want to talk about the evolution of cultural fields very quickly. Um, and and uh, from a perspective on sustainability, which is what I uh, think we should put on the center to uh, uh, include the different scales of realities. So we have a historical evolution of institutions that in our countries still um, exist together as we have the 19th century and the uh, in the 21st uh, century together. When we started our institutions in the 70s and even before, we had all those national institutions not to put in value our um, local identities, but our national construction. And this national construction was always looking at the um, more central and metropolitan powers. So we had a divorce between this fine arts and material heritage which was the core of our institutions uh, in contradiction with our intangible heritage and the popular culture. This has changed only in the, after 2000 with the UNESCO Convention on Intangible Heritage. Uh, that's a real um, conflict between our, in our soul, let's say. Uh, regarding the, this, we had the cultural industries, and for many, many years, we had the TV or the film industry very far from ourselves, just consuming. And that we had the uh, illusion of what that was changing with this digital reality. But as you said in, in the previous uh, uh, presentations, the how we participate now in big platforms or in digital centers of innovation, it's only the same reason, the same portion that we used to have towards traditional film industry or music industry. So uh, this popular culture started through uh, the cultural industries uh, being mediatic and uh, became media performance with Sports, massive concerts for the samba in Brazil, or that kind of uh, um, more spectacularized expressions. And then we have all the creative industries. The, the, the dialogue regarding creative industries uh, didn't start with us. It came to us from uh, the reality that started in Europe first, and. Uh, more Anglo-Saxon world, then Barcelona, then Colombia. And little by little, it came to Central America. It didn't came in the 80s, where, when what that happened, when that came into the dialogue for Colombia or Argentina, because we were in the time of crossing the peace, uh, time from war to peace. So we didn't take that agenda uh, into, our, into to our reality only 20 years past the 80s. Then we have the entertainment industry, which came for us with tourism, essentially. And then all the discussion around public space and the community life, the public space quality, 
It's also for Central America. Uh, we are the less decentralized region in Latin America. So the debate on urbanism and local development and this decentralization is really young too. Finally, this big uh, uh, amount cluster of uh, circles uh, have in their boundaries um, four big issues that make the field of culture each time wider. First of all, the technology with the creative industries, then the formal and informal education as our system gets uh, uh, critical because, uh, for example, in Costa Rica, even with our investment, 50%, almost 50% of our young people stays out of the formal system. Then we ask the culture to solve in some kind of way what we lose in this platform. Then cultural rights and diversity, the other side, and tourism. Those spaces became like the border of the cultural field with institutions that stays built as they were in the beginning with fine arts and material heritage as the core. Finally, we have now new jobs, industries, consumer and business models with digital reality, and also the debate on migration, new tribes in urban space, and um, uh, those realities also interwining with this frame, with this old frame, uh, all both new realities and old models uh, coexisting. Then we have a kind of uh, um, difficult uh, relations between what we understand as culture for citizenship and social fabric and then uh, culture as a resource production and consumption, but also with the uh, uh, dynamics of gentrification, commodification, and for our countries, the exotizations of, of our diversity for tourism. Then also a uh, gap between professionalism and market, mostly in cities and local development and rurality, uh, very much uh, different in their uh, possibilities. Mm -hmm. And then between deregulation, commercial liberal, uh, trade of goods and service, and what we know as uh, a very hard time for supporting, tolerating migration or uh, the movement of people looking for better opportunities for their life. Finally, all of this made three big um, modes of knowledge and of reality, which are the or our oral cultures and expression, we still uh, we still are very alive in our rural uh, localities, in our indigenous groups, then the literal, literate cultures ex and expressions, and finally, the audiovisual cultures and digital churn, which is now getting really solid in our uh, cultural fields. Young people, as we all know in uh, everywhere in the world, are really changing their ways of consumption very fast, but we are not getting that fast to assume as producers the very sophisticated, uh, sophisticated ways of augmented reality, of uh, video mapping, all of that kind of things are again, as was the film industry uh, many years ago, coming from a more central uh, producers, and then we are turning again to being more passive consumers. So our policy in Costa Rica, at least, uh, has four big um, issues, participation and true access to cultural rights, then uh, cultural economic dynamizations, cultural heritage, and institutional strengthening. We have also two agendas, one in indigenous right, uh, the, our policy, actual current policy is from 2013, and it has been uh, an important um, consultation to indigenous people. And then a digital and innovation agenda where I find we have the uh, critical um, challenges, where this uh, relation between academy and research needs to be put at, uh, at the center so we can increase our abilities to innovate our institutions and our policies. 
In this relation, participation and strengthening of the institutions are the same big challenge of change. We are very decentralized. We have almost our all our infrastructure in two kilometers in the center of the country and very small investment, historical investment in the uh, regions outside the big city in our capital. And then this relation between cultural heritage and dynamization of culture. We used to think at this problem in the same way that we are trying to uh, promote with the frame of sustainability, which is a smart way of understanding balance that our country has been successful on putting in the center for environment. And that's it, that all the resources we have from nature aren't here for us to use in all kinds of ways. We need to make um, a circle, virtuoso a circle between the use we give to those resources and their preservation. So we have, as we have in uh, environment, the culture as heritage and social fabric. Uh, and we understand that as a trophic circuit of care and sociocultural animation. And in the other side, the culture as resource for um, jobs, for employment, for develop economical development, where our circuit has to uh, include market and monetarization. But at the same, same way it happens for uh, environment, uh, we can't use everything for profit. We need to use some part to take care of it so we can um, take care for the future of what we call the primary forest of creativity, coexistence and governance. And in the other side, employment, employment market and development of sectors. And that kind of sustainable circular relationship with the human, with humans and planet security as the core has to be the way we look at uh, culture and dynamization. This is a very hard work as it is for sustainable environment because the tensions between the use and the things we need from those resources and what we need to do to take care of them, it is always hard to put in our mind. So we have two circles that um, goes from the local heritage, their manif manifestations, the local agents that keep them alive, the local and traditional institutions and the exchanges with other cultures. Um, and then how those uh, issues become, um, become strong for market as products, as entrepreneurial uh, dynamics, as uh, institution for this entrepreneurial development and the markets in exchange. That's coming from safeguard to setting the value. If you come from the uh, safeguard dynamic and then to the market. And if you go in the other way, you go from the use of resources to a sense of co-responsibility. And that's where I want to take my, my conclusions because I think I'm already almost in time, isn't it? I, perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, excuse me, how, yeah. how long I have? You're yeah, perfectly fine if you come to the conclusions now and then we can have some questions and answers. Okay, I'm going to... Um, uh, those, uh, uh, those, uh, uh, those diapositivas uh, has to do with how digital is going to be challenging for our uh, traditional institution in this uh, phase of evolution. And what I think we should come to, there's a little bit of explanation of how is our country. This is the central, the very centralized development model we have and how this centralization reflects on uh, this center of San Jose, the great uh, metropolitan area and the secondary city, cities. All, as you can see, are in the center of the country and it reflects exactly how you what you find in the index of human development by county. You have the uh, wealthy Costa Rica in the center of the country and the poorest uh, surrounding it, as you have in the uh, 
extreme the, at my right, the uh, relation urban and rural. It, it is tourism and environment that has changed a little bit coming from the center to uh, the outside part. So uh, regarding knowledge and that kind of um, uh, interpretation we can have on, um, on our reality, we need to make knowledge products and exchange uh, a tool for management, for development and well-being. In our reality, what happens is that those realms are not uh, dialoguing enough, so uh, the institution's lack of uh, know knowledge and learning processes, and the academy lacks of co-responsibility with the quality and the evolution of our institutions. So we have a lot of criticisms, but uh, not, a, not enough of transformation and uh, uh, quality of those institutions uh, thanks to what knowledge can do for that. Uh, I think it is desirable to socialize uh, work in progress and knowledge should be then the product of collaborative construction as you need to do that uh, with grassroots and um, technicians, for example, you need to do that between academy and institutions. Uh, that's the way and it's the way we are working, more prototyping and dialoguing between the sectors uh, that we can co-build, um, co-produce the a more open and learning system so we can uh, accelerate the change in our institutions, which is a hard work, but that needs to be done if we can, uh, if we want to address our challenges. Uh, we should avoid speaking only for uh, the specialists uh, because that's a, also a tricky uh, place. For example, for artists and uh, leaders, social leaders to interact with institutions and with academy. And also uh, we should uh, look towards a more utopic ethical where we as cultural, institutional, and academic agents, we assume we need to promote, summon, provoke, and invigorate all the system, not substitute local or entrepreneurial forces, which is easy. Uh, sometimes it's a tendency, even uh, because of the way cooperation is built. Um, for example, the rules in terms of how much you uh, introduce experts from other countries or even from the countries that cooperate and how that relations allow us to build our own uh, capacities. Uh, we need less protect or sponsor and more promote, empower and articulate. And then assume that we have hierarchies in this exchange so we can eth ethically try to maintain fair play in the process. Mediate the conflicts of interest in, pursu in pursuit of the common good and of uh, a more uh, equivalent exchange. And finally, improve the transparency of negotiations and lobby, which is true for social, uh, social civil society regarding governments, but also for local agents regarding cooperation. And that would be my... Uh, uh, my uh, concerns, the concerns I wanted to share with you from this perspective of being in the um, management of cultural policy and institutionality and how we can make more, uh, um, how can we increase this empowering process as the political aspect and also the co-responsibility and the sustainability as uh, the economical uh, benefit. Because in a world where things are not even, we should make some uh, compromise with this uh, sustainability and uh, co-responsibility so we can make more even the dialogue and cooperation. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Duan. Um, I'm very happy that you gave us such a comprehensive presentation was really rich putting culture at the heart of 
many things actually, the whole development question, the rights issue, the employment identity issues. Um, perhaps one question, um, what do you think would be the role for one Europe, the European Union, with regard to the conce concepts and plans you spelled out? And second, the wider Latin American region, what would you think would be the, the role to play for Europe and Latin America? Um, well, I think um, we should work as it been happening with some of the uh, programs that are already uh, set up, like Ibermedia or um, the European programs that allows and promote in between the European countries to make more co-production or uh, to increase the exchange of goods and services. I think we sh should uh, assume more the sustainable and economical aspect of that. There has been a lot of um, investment and production and less in platforms of exchange and I think finally we are uh, all uh, facing the same um, concentration of uh, big distributors and platforms. So um, I think that in the same way it happens here, even if it's more mature in Europe, the, the balance between uh, production and contents and platform, platforms distribution and exchange, it hasn't been uh, yet as uh, even. Um, so we've been producing a lot, but not uh, really ensuring that we have more uh, ways of sharing our, our contents. Okay. I think we should go into the, in, in that direction and maybe uh, being more clear about what kind of sustainability and economic uh, management system under some of our um, initiatives. Some things are uh, being supported by market and some things are supported by more social policies and sometimes those uh, the clarity of that is not so good on, on, on top of our construction. Thank you so much. Um, do we have time, perhaps, any question from the audience? Yes, please use the microphone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Christian Gimers from IRELAC. Uh, in the very broad conception that uh, the minister presented here, very interesting. However, I wonder why academics and universities uh, don't appear as a major stakeholder of uh, this cultural uh, dimension, and especially for uh, being stakeholder in the internationalization and especially the cooperation with the EU. Uh, I wonder because there is uh, already some academic summit at the margin of the EU CELAC uh, summit for the head of state and government and in the minister discourse university don't appear at all. So uh, I would okay. like to... I, I think the question is clear, perhaps it has to do with the as a, also a minister for higher education research but I pass it on to Minister Duran. Uh, well, I think we, we uh, that there's a, a lot of cooperation in between universities where the dialogue and the gap is, I think it's locally for us between the institutions and the universities um, as a common uh, responsibility for uh, the actualization and improvement of our uh, state uh, institutions. I think that that comes from our 
not, not in Costa Rica, but in our surroundings, the lack of uh, uh, strong democratic institutions. So many times the university has been playing a role of balance and um, uh, more tension with uh, governmental institutions. And then uh, in Costa Rica, uh, for, for example, in the last uh, administration, uh, the government and the academy has built a common agenda for development programs for the public policy. This, is, this hasn't been the regular way of working together. Um, where a lot of money put in Costa Rica for education, but then the research, for example, it has taken a long time uh, for the public university to become more um, in dialogue with private sector and with govern governmental institutions. Um, I couldn't say now exactly how these uh, uh, weak relations, let's say, uh, evolve that way, but um, uh, the autonomy of university and more research, uh, like art for art and research for research, um, it's just very recently that it has, it's been changing a little bit because of the uh, private uh, universities and also because we need much more um, investment on innovation, for example, um, there, there has been uh, a little ¿cómo se llama? isolation of both public systems, which is the academical one and the institutional one. So uh, it's, I think that the gap is here between those two spheres. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Minister Duran. I think it's been a real pleasure and privilege to have you with us for this opening of the panel on culture and academic ties. I think we will move on to the presentations here at the panel, but um, once again, very much thank you for sharing your presentation and uh, having the time for us here. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me there. And thanks that you managed also the mm -hmm. technological difficulties. I think it turned out all fine in the end. <laughs> Bueno. Okay. Yeah, for the team. Okay. The Thank you. Okay. So um, perhaps let me introduce the panel we have here in the room uh, now as we move on. Um, we have with us Elisa Grafuyev, who is Cluster Development Director at the European Union of National Institutes of Culture, and she will go First, we've got second, Anne Speerschneider, the head of division Central and South America from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. And we have got, as the final speaker, Angel Badillo from the Elcano Institute. I hope we will have concise uh, statements as an input and then move on to a debate on the panel and with all of you. So to kick us off, I would... Uh, pass the microphone to Elisa. Hello. So, hello everyone. First of all, thank you for the invitation to be with you today. I am going to be very short, I promise. Uh, so I'm going to speak about the great opportunity we have ahead of us to uh, continue strengthening the relationship between the European Union and Latin America. Of course, I'm going to speak on the side of the European Union. And I'm going to speak, in fact, about the current political framework of the EU in the field of international cultural relations, because that's uh, an opportunity that we have now. Of course, there is a long track record of collaboration between the EU and uh, the region of Latin America and the Caribbean, but now the European Union for the first time has a political document establishing the principles, establishing the approach, and establishing the uh, thematic priorities 
for its work in international cultural relations. And this is not only for Latin America, but for the whole of the world. So previous collaborations were done on the basis of specific agreements and partnerships with different regions, but now we have a comprehensive approach to that. And uh, this uh, is established or proposed in a, a joint communication by the European External Action Service and the European Commission that is titled Towards an EU Strategy for International Cultural Relations. So this document is it's very important. It was published in June 2016, so two years ago. But it is going to give the direction not only for the work of the EU in this field, but also for the member states of the EU. I'm going to highlight four aspects of this document that are particularly relevant to this forum uh, we're having today. So first of all is the definition of culture. Uh, the previous question, what, where, where is education? Where is, uh, where is higher education? What are the education and academic stakeholders? Well, the new definition that it proposes, that the joint communication proposes for culture is wider and deeper, and it goes beyond the arts. It includes other areas such as education, such as science, tourism, sustainable development, etc. So it goes beyond the arts to really encompass a wider approach to it. Okay? Second aspect, very important, is how it defines cultural diplomacy. Again, here we're going beyond the traditional approach of just promoting European cultural diversity or promoting cultures in the EU to really engage in that genuine dialogue, to exchange, to co-create, to learn from each other. It's people-to-people -people contact that this document is proposing. It is about discussing, learning from each other, and defining together what we want and we can do together. So that's very important, beyond showcasing, going into people-to-people -people links and connections. Third thing that I am going to highlight is the areas for cooperation, the thematic work streams which are socio-economic development, intercultural dialogue, and also cultural heritage, very important as well. Finally, it also proposes, and that's the fourth thing I am going to highlight from this document, it proposes a stronger cooperation between the EU institutions and its member states, of course, because, as you know, culture is a, is a competence of EU member states, and the EU there is to support the member states' actions and activities in this area. So what the document proposes is a series of actions, among which a closer cooperation between the European Commission and the European External Action Service and the European Union National Institutes for Culture, which, as you know, is the network bringing together the national cultural institutes from the EU member states as well as other uh, relevant national bodies within EU member states that are also working in cultural diplomacy and cultural relations. So uh, just for those who are less familiar with UNIC, UNIC brings together 36 members from all 28 EU member states and on the ground it is present in over 80 countries through what we call UNIC clusters and these are collaboration platforms that are established when at least three UNIC members are based in the same city, region or country. And these clusters, what they do is to work together and with local stakeholders to build this trust and understanding to strengthen these connections between the peoples of the EU and the peoples of the rest of the world. So going back to the joint communication and the third aspect that I was highlighting, this is stronger cooperation or enhanced cooperation between the European Commission and the European External Action Service and uh, UNIC uh, as network and also through its members. In the, f in, uh, the following year, so last year in May 2017, an administrative ar arrangement was signed between the Commission, External Action Service and UNIC in order to implement this is stronger collaboration and it is aimed at strengthening collaborations between EU delegations and UNIC clusters on the ground so that together they can better work together with local stakeholders in building this trust and understanding in people-to-people -people contact. Um, what I want to highlight here is that uh, under the framework of these administrative arrangements, we carried out a 
baseline study to understand what is the current situation of these partnerships between clusters and delegations. I'm not going to elaborate on it because I could be speaking for a whole day <laughs> about that. But uh, the conclusions and recommendations of that report have been endorsed by the unique General Assembly and, of course, the European External Action Service and the Commission have reviewed them. They are happy with them, so we will be starting with implementation of these recommendations. What I will highlight is that one of the actions following from these recommendations is to have joint seminars between clusters and EU delegations so that they learn how to work together under this joint communication, under this framework of people-to-people -people dialogue to work more and better with local stakeholders. And one of the first seminars we are going to test with is going to take place in Latin America, in Colombia, in the autumn. So. This is a very good opportunity to start working more uh, closely with this region for us and, of course, for you, with you. Uh, and this is also aligned with another very important political document published by the European Union only last month, the new European Agenda for Culture, which highlights or presents the approach to culture that the European Union will have over the next years. And it has three dimensions, so it highlights three dimensions of culture, social dimension, economic dimension, and external dimension, for which this, the specific objective is to strengthen international cultural relations. And even there, there is a, a suggestion to start working on regional strategies in the field of culture, and the Latin American region is suggested as one of the areas to begin with. So we have a lot of opportunities there. The political framework on the EU side is there, and also political support from uh, member states and EU institutions. And I will be finishing now. Well, thank you very much, Elisa. I think we come back to some of the issues, but I think it was very very instructive for us to see the role of the European Union in this field, which is very much uh, the competence of nation states still, and also at, um, at the federal level and uh, for federal entities. Okay, uh, I pass it on to Mrs. Speerschneider from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Now is more on the academic side. Thank you very much. Uh, hello to everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here with you representing a very small research funding institution from Germany, which is funded itself by the federal government, by different ministries of the federal government. Our main core is to foster um, excellent researchers from abroad to come for a research stay in Germany. And through these people, uh, of course, we have a, a, a very uh, broad network in more than 140 countries in the world, um, about, about 28,000 people. 15, 55 Nobel laureates about uh, between these people and we try to foster on um, individual excellence, not projects, so there's a bit of a difference to what we have heard so far because uh, it was more focused on the possibilities that, um, for instance, the European Union has to foster certain sorts of uh, collaborations between the region of the European Union member states and um, Latin America as a whole, uh, even though there's not a, a single counterpart, but um, some countries that do have agreements with the European um, union, others have uh, sectoral things um, and in the different um, sectors that have been already presented today, uh, this might differ as well. Um, so having said that, uh, I would like to uh, perhaps foster uh, um, look more into um, the people that uh, are the stakeholders and also the uh, the the ones that are addressed. It's not necessarily only the, the governments and the political uh, level that uh, brings policies into, uh, into the countries and uh, tries to, to change the framework, but it's also the individuals that make the difference. And they uh, are the minorities that have been mentioned, or they work at universities, they um, work as teachers in Europe or in Latin America, Latin America facing totally different um, realities. And uh, when we talk about this bi-regional collaboration in, in culture, um, I have just learned that science and uh, education uh, are part of this uh, broader 
a new dimension that the European Union is giving um, culture, so I'm, I'm very glad about that. Um, but uh, there's still uh, DG research and, and others, uh, and in the countries in the region in Latin America, there are um, ministries for education, and in six uh, countries there's also ministry for research, and they have uh, their own agenda, and um, yeah, the, the newest Ministry of Research has been established just a few weeks ago in Chile, but there's no minister yet. Um, I, we all hope that uh, this minister will, uh, ministry will be operative uh, starting next year. So there's uh, a lot of uh, changes that also Latin American countries are facing because of this. Um, and um, yeah, it was said before that there's a transition, there would be a transition from money to knowledge. I think also the, the installation of these new sorts of ministries that focus on, on research, and research normally is intended to create also innovation, knowledge, but also innovation, are significant uh, at this point after the, the crisis has come to the, the financial crisis that uh, hit the world. Um, is not yet overcome, but we're getting all out of the, the, the lowest part of the, or the hardest part of the crisis. So I think this might be an optimistic signal for other countries also in the region. But I think there's also a big difference between um, the European countries and the European Union and Latin America. That was also mentioned um, in, the, in the first uh, talks uh, during the morning. And that is that, uh, well, we do have Bologna process here in, in Europe. There's nothing like that in Latin America. There, it is difficult to, to bring a degree from a university in, in country X to country Z in Latin America. It might even be more if, easier to bring it to, to Europe than inside the, the region. So there's a, um, it was said that uh, there's... Um, weak institutions or that sometimes there is a lack of institutions and institutions that do exist do not work the way one would want them to, to work. I think in, in the, the academic uh, yeah, part of uh, the, the societies and also in, when it comes to education, this is very significant because there is no comparability comparability, um, comparability um, and or oh, it is difficult to, to compare the realities, but we tend to speak of Latin America as a whole, and it is very different. It was just said that inside the countries there are also very big differences. So if one thinks of Brazil, um, that has not been mentioned uh, today so much yet, um, it is 200 million or more than 200 million inhabitants, and uh, what is happening in the north is totally different from what is uh, happening also in, in education and research in the federal state of Sao Paulo. So, uh, you don't need to move so far, <laughs> even in, inside one country, even though it's a lot of kilometers. So I think uh, this 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 are uh, very big challenges, but it is, um, as the minister said um, just, um, just um, a few minutes ago, small-scale initiatives matter. And the, all the European countries and many Latin American countries and also actors have a lot of... Um, um, experiences, very good experiences on these small initiatives that normally start at the bilateral level between, for instance, one school and another school, one university or a faculty in a university with others. And, and we have made very good, uh, have had very good experiences in Europe with this. If we think about the Erasmus Mundus um, um, yeah, the, the master's programs, the doctoral programs, such things could be a good practice example for some Latin American countries that would want to engage with something like that. I think there's a lot of experience and also many people from Latin America who have participated in these programs. So there's experience also from people from there that know where it went well and where perhaps not so well. There's the Alban program that already ran out. Um, Brazil made a big effort with Ciencias Sin Fronteras um, with 100,000 100, fellowships to bring Brazilians abroad. So that, there are some initiatives where one could uh, look at um, in order to enhance and increase this already existing collaboration, which is strong in many cases 
In other cases, there's still something to explore, but I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities and, and it's a good moment to, to do this. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. I think um, it echoes a bit what Guillermo Fernandez Soto said earlier about the pitfalls of integration in Latin America and the harmonization of academic degrees, of uh, academic careers, certainly is one of the uh, points which still could could improve, to put it that way. Um, but I would also want to highlight that also in Europe we've got big differences between our institutions and one of the big challenges I think we have is with the Brexit that really the two most important universities of the continent will no longer be part of the European Union. I think we are really, we have not really reflected enough that this for the academic side of the European Union really marks a watershed moment also. Okay, but I would pass it on to Angel Badillo um, for your presentation. There's a presentation I guess we could help you to follow my words. Thank you very much, Bert, and uh, thank you all our colleagues of uh, Bruegel and Giga and uh, all of you present here. <coughs> uh, thank you. Uh, okay, I've prepared a brief, some brief notes to, to um, share. Uh, quick notes, three quick notes on the, on this question. I will focus basically uh, on the cultural th on the cultural question and the cultural uh, relation. And my first uh, question or my, my my first issue to discuss is what tie our cultural ties. Is there something to tie, in fact? Uh, is there something common between Latin America and Europe? Because this is something from the cultural point of view uh, has to be, is absolutely necessary to determine. And uh, in, 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 in this question, I would like to, to share a couple of uh, uh, ideas or a couple of notes we, uh, in fact, we used uh, with Emilio Lamo for a recent paper which will be published in the second half of, of this year. Uh, to understand the proximity, cultural proximity between both regions. And uh, the first thing we have to remember is that uh, Latin American societies are mixed societies with this beautiful uh, word from Spanish, which is mestizaje, uh, which come from Latin, mixtitius, from mixed. It's a, basically societies based on, on mixed of different traditions. Basically, a uh, big axis, central axis of indigenous cultures, the original nations uh, or originary nations, if you want to, um, and, and Latin America um, original uh, communities. From that, all the colonial migrations uh, arrived to Latin America from 16th to 19th century, basically Portuguese and Spanish, but uh, also from other origins. And very important in this period, slave traffic and uh, the emergence of all these Creole communities, uh, so important to define and to create national identities from the 18th uh, to the 19th centuries. And Finally, all the, the, the final contribution of all this mix, which, is, which are the recent migrations of uh, 19th and 20th century, um, basically Europeans, uh, especially since 1880, uh, and all the internal movements, migration move, movements that are, have also redefined in terms of uh, assimilation and discussion of identity, the, 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 the identity of contemporary Latin America. So what is Latin America now and what is Europe now in terms of, of cultural proximity? Well, we used with Emilio some ideas of this uh, fantastic project, which is the World Value Survey of Inglehart and other colleagues. And uh, well, uh, they, uh, from a, a massive uh, survey in uh, an enormous number of, of, uh, of people around the world, they uh, ask uh, them about um, a lot of questions, but really, really a lot of questions, a huge questionnaire, to define, uh, to order, to classify um, clusters of societies 
from two axes, which are the materialistic axis, which is in the base of this graphic, and the tradition modernity uh, values uh, axis, which is uh, in the other one. So what we find, this is the, one of the graphics of the amazing Engelhard research, uh, and we are here, we are in the center, more or less, uh, Catholic Europe, and English-speaking Europe and Protestant Europe, you see it on the upper part of the graphic, and Latin America in the center to the, to the bottom of the graphic. And what we see is that we are pretty close in the middle of the graphic uh, with differences in traditional values more uh, evident in Latin America and less, uh, less attached in European societies, but we are pretty close. We are close in, the, in this map of cultural identities. Uh, so when we uh, try to, to, uh, to clean up a little bit this, uh, this uh, schema, what we find is that um, more or less some countries of the Catholic Europe are close to some countries, very, very close. In fact, these clusters are artificially, of course, made by Engel Haar and his team but, and its colleagues. But uh, if, we, uh, if we see it without these clusters, we see that they are close. Chile, Argentina, Brazil are pretty close to Spain, Portugal, Poland, etc. in reference to these materialistic and, and, or post-materialistic and traditional secular uh, versus rational values in the Engelhardt uh, research. So, uh, in fact, in, uh, in, a, in a word which interested us much, uh, one of the Engelhardt colleagues, Basanias, uh, two years ago, called that, uh, called that cluster of Latin America and Southern Europe countries uh, an identity of cultures of joy, which would be different from the other two big clusters of cultures, which will be the cultures of achievement based on achievement and the cultures based on honor. On honor. Uh, so it will be joy, achievement, and honor. And they say, well, in fact, culturally, we are close, uh, Europe and Latin America, from this perspective of uh, values, post-materialistic values, uh, and this, this so-called, by Basanyev, uh, cultures of joy. So we are pretty close uh, culturally, but at the same time we share a very important uh, thing from the cultural point of view, uh, a very important resource, which is we share a common language, uh, a language which is a very important language in Latin America, or two very important languages in Latin America, even if we are not using it today, and, uh, and, and also a very important uh, 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 strategic uh, resource for cultural resource for the European Union, which are Spanish and Portuguese. I would like to remember that Spanish has uh, 500 million speakers around the world and, um, and I want to insist has to be a central resource for the future of uh, Europe, particularly, particularly the post-Brexit Europe, and uh, even if the paradox uh, emerge, uh, United Kingdom is constantly remembering Spanish is the most important language in strategic terms for the future of its society. And uh, British Council has underlined that year after year in its uh, reports on the importance of languages uh, around the world, with a big distance uh, in relation with Chinese or Arabic or etc. So one of these resource, cultural resource, resource that unites us is part of both culture. Portuguese and Spanish are central languages for in the European Union and for the CELAC uh, community. So let me underline that Spanish is one of the most powerful EU cultural assets. Second thing, uh, well, we have a common ground from the cultural point of view, but does it make culture flow between both regions? Well, the answer is no. And why the answer is no? Why, why, what's, what, what are the conditions for and the foundations of cultural policies and, uh, that makes um, so, so difficult to make uh, culture flow between both regions? Well, 
um, in fact, first because I think that uh, even if culture has always been in center of uh, bilateral relation, few resources have been devoted to culture uh, in the discourse, but not in effective programs of cultural cooperation or um, or co-production, uh, for, for instance, compared with other areas. Um, culture has been slowly developed as a key, key policy area in, in Latin America. I will come to this um, in a moment. And the question of, uh, and Elisa has underlined it too, the question of that culture is a responsibility for nations, for nation states in the European Union. And that has been, um, that has been increased uh, by, the, by two emerging paradigms, paradigms in the last years in the field of culture that has uh, really consolidated the national approach to this question. The first one is culture is influence. And uh, this has made, uh, this, this has promoted cultural diplomacy as central to the nation's external action. It is true that we are coordinating through unique uh, this uh, external action, but we are coordinating, coordinating national uh, interest external action. This is very important from my point of view. Uh, we haven't found yet uh, common goals. We haven't found, uh, I mean, we are in the starting point of this uh, external act cultural action from the European Union. And secondly, culture is also uh, um, a key thing on economic growth. And this is also important for nations, for producing um, the, 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 what, what we will call the creative industry shift uh, in the last 10 years, uh, okay? Um, creating um, wealth and creating employment in post-industrial societies. This from one point of view. At the same, at the same time, I will, um, I will summarize that to, to be uh, shorter. Uh, Latin America, the culture in Latin America has passed over a situation uh, critical uh, in, um, in, in the 20th century. Um, after World War II, uh, both Latin America and Europe depended on U.S. mass culture um, marketing mechanisms or distribution systems to go to get the global distribution. That means that to get to the other, we had to get to the US. I mean, we cannot, European culture cannot get to Latin America, or Latin American culture cannot get to Europe if not passing through the, uh, through the, the, the American systems. So even like that, well, national cultural structures were created. Uh, Costa Rica created a cultural secretariat for the first time in 1970, UNESCO and its debates, uh, and, and all the, 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 the emergence of cultural nationalism has also helped in that. In the 20th century, I would like to, under, to, to underline that regional cooperation policies and structures have promoted Co-production has established collaboration frameworks between institutions and had stimulated uh, cultural circulation from an industrial economic point of view. And I would like especially to remark the success of the Ibero-American community and the Ibero-American cooperation programs in which four, in, in some of them, four Europeans, uh, European countries are involved, Andorra, Portugal, Spain, and since 2016, Italy in Ibermedia program. So we have uh, some stories of success and cooperation in a part uh, that, that could be followed, studied, and maybe uh, replicated in other uh, sections of, uh, in, in this case, from the European, European uh, Union. And at the same time, these regional cooperation policies ha uh, has been um, um, let's say, seismically moved by the fragmentation of political polarization in the, re in the region and, um, and well, and the, the changes, the political changes in the region. So for, for the end, I will talk about it uh, in the questions if you want. For the end, I have uh, kept three questions, okay? Or three situations that should be or could be uh, post, uh, post on, on, the, on the table to discuss. The first one would be uh, 
there are deep changes in the traditional regional integration schemes in Latin America and the Caribbean, and uh, there are there's an emergence of less institutionalized schemes as a consequence of uh, a more fragmented uh, regional relations. I would like to question how about working with regions or cities in cultural cooperation to find, to surpass these uh, new conditions of uh, cooperation in the region, of, of integration in the region. And what about the diasporas? There are many Latin Americans right now in Europe that could al also work as an actor in this process of approach between both regions. The second factor I would like to, under to underline, the eastern turn of the European Union, integration of new members, what has been called the Eastern Partnership Fatigue, the critical situation in the Middle East and the Mediterranean, of course, and Asia definitely becoming a central player in geopolitics. And finally, a shift in the traditional balance between both regions, economically, socially, culturally, due to the growth of Latin America uh, and the stagnation of EU economies that has to be considered in terms of a new kind of cooperation. So how to stimulate cultural bilateral cooperation in this new um, fragmented map of actors and networks of integration? How to look back to the Atlantic while the East preserves on? And how to redefine cultural relations to embrace what uh, Commissioner Mimitsa called this morning, moving from traditional development cooperation to a more modern partnership for mutual benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Angel. Big questions on the table. I think for all the panelists, yes, uh, you can. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, we want to have some time for debate, so I will not do what I had thought to do the I first round the on the on the panel as such, just we collect some of the questions. I could kick it off perhaps with one to Elisa, um, which is the question on, we've heard so much about the nation, nation state, the competence of the nation state and national uh, political or national culture. Culture often is a very much a regional identity and we don't only have to think about Catalonia at present, also in Germany culture is not uh, competence of the of the nation state, but very much at the federal state's level. So, uh, is there any way you cope with regional identities at the EU level? How could you integrate that into your picture? And a question for for uh, Anders Speerschneider would be: um, We had this in the in the previous uh, panel also the issue of brain drain. And if we do these academic exchanges, what we've often seen in the past is that it was not really an exchange, but was a stepping stone towards a certain brain drain or a very high level academic migration towards the richer or better paying countries in a way. And what is your experience in how can you do an exchange that does produce brain gains for both sides? How do you protect the circularity, the return of the, uh, um, the awardees of scholarships? And I think, on a general sense, what could the, we learn from uh, this issue? But before you answer, I would suggest to collect more questions from the audience. Yes. Do you have a microphone near you? about the intellectual property rights uh, between uh, European Union and Latin America countries because it's issue for the Asia. Is it issue for Latin America also? Yes, okay. Another question, Fabio? Yeah. Hello, me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, just two, two and a half uh, questions, answers. No, first one. But... Sorry? But short. Concise, yes. uh, well, then I, I will I will keep keep it just with one or two. Okay. The first one, the first one comment I think is important to emphasize that not only Europe is moving eastern and becoming less Atlantic. Brexit is an example of that. 
but that's happening also in Latin America. And the growth of the Pacific Alliance shows that it's the most active part of Latin America and uh, is moving away from Europe, modeling to the United States, but less and less with Europe. And I think that that's important. I and mean, in cultural terms, it's extremely important. The second, the second comment is the following. I think it has not been enough emphasized the uh, economic value of languages, the, 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 the economic dimension of languages in general. No? Uh, at least in two, in two uh, contexts. First, in itself, in itself, uh, we have the language industries. We talked before about digitalization. After all, digital pages are in some natural languages, uh, and therefore that that's a, has a, a, a crucial economic relevance. And second, and second uh, obviously, cultural similarities and language similarities provide with the lowering of transaction costs in any kind of economic relation. Uh, uh, for example, that's crucial, for example, in terms of FDI. Uh, the, the, a strong economic Spanish investment in Latin America would have been impossible without you know, the, the proximity of the languages. So it has, it has an extreme, extremely important. The world is not flat, as, as Friedman said. It is not flat. And, and cultural, cultural barriers and language barriers are extremely, extremely important. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Alexander from the Hungarian Institute for Foreign Affairs. So I, when you were saying uh, Eastern pressure, I took it on myself, the pressure for me. Um, uh, actually, you know, we are and we will remain, however, any other news in the media, uh, EU member states. So I think instead of mourning about Eastern pressure, um, what we should do is getting more closer Eastern, Central, Eastern European countries to Latin America. And uh, the way how it, we can do it, um, and now I'm skipping for the next part with um, Ms. Sperschneider, is uh, doing some kind of exchanges, uh, an Erasmus program for a sub-Erasmus program for Latin American and European exchanges. And right now, just at the edge of the new EU budget, we are not pushing for a sub-chapter inside Erasmus for this goal, what I think most of us are pushing to get some kind of bi-regional um, um, exchange for students, for professors or whatever, just to get know each other a bit better. Um, that's all, thanks. So we've got two more questions, then we have to close to get back to the panel. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Mr. Angel, uh, you stress that culture is influence. And what is exactly what do you mean with these uh, sentences? regarding to what European Union reflect to do uh, regarding Latin American. Because it seems to me a little, I don't know, I want um, something. Okay, other it's thing a clear that you, question. No, yes, the other thing you said is uh, that uh, one of the three questions you put in your uh, in your presentation was regarding again because it is not the first time that it is said this uh, in this uh, cell is regard in this room is regarding the uh, the fragmented structure. What do you mean repeating this? Because I don't think that we in Latin America and Caribbean are fragmented, you know, and we have to. Uh, you have to, when you have a regard. We are not fragmented. We are uh, we are countries that we have differences, but uh, within the differences we are united, and we uh, we have to continue with the cooperation with everything, and we have to take from each other what is uh, what is uh, good to go ahead with this uh, cooperation. And the other question is regarding uh, the lady. I don't know his name. Her name is uh, Anne. Anne, 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 excuse me. Uh, Anne, when she said, uh, it's of course you have Bologna system in education, high education, and it's very good. You have very good uh, universities, 
but we also in Latin America have good centers, uh, high educational centers, and we have also uh, form in these centers good, uh, good, uh, uh, good uh, scientists and a good specialist. And we think that uh, we cannot have, uh, we cannot have uh, everything cannot be homogeneous, you know. And in this, uh, we have to look from this heterogeneous. A, a, a complex system we have in each of our countries we have to look of what is a good experience to go ahead and to try to uh, exchange good experience we know that you have a very good uh, system but it took time it it, it have took time you know I and I think just not to have a misunderstanding, I think the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation probably is the um, best place to know how well the Latin American universities and research centers are. And actually, they have quite a high number also of uh, bodies in Cuba, from Cuba. Um, the president of the Cuban Academy of Sciences now also is a Humboldt Fellow. So I think it's just so that Anne doesn't have to say it, I'd say it, um, they don't think that the European University is in any way superior, but uh, have a high respect for this. Okay, final question. Yes, uh, thanks you, Mr. Chairman. Irelak again. I have just two uh, remarks. One, the first one is about uh, Eastern uh, attraction. Uh, which is, according to me, now about to change, because, as you know, the stupid uh, builds wall and the wise build bridge. And Mr. Trump is doing a pretty nice, maybe the only one, uh, effort uh, for closing the gap on both sides of the Atlantic with, between Latin America and the EU, because due to the return to uh, a mercantilism, protectionism from the 30s, uh, Latin America and Europe are again obliged to look uh, to a common goal, which is their own integration based upon the cultural assets, linguistic or not, it doesn't matter so much. Economic is driving the world, as you know, and so I am glad to see that Mr. Trump is helping us to build bridge between Europe and Latin America. This was the first remark. The second one is about uh, for the for Anne uh, is the fact that apparently you don't mention that we have a special chapter now since the Brussels Declaration in the summit EU CELAC. Uh, about higher education, innovation, and technology. And there is an action plan. And in the academic summit, which is a bottom-up movement, we have also an action plan for these small link and cooperation between universities. This is a very, very powerful instrument for building uh, common culture and especially economic ties with the innovation challenge. Uh, Latin America has now a total factor productivity which is lower than in the 60s. And without a cooperation with Europe, I don't see any means to solve this. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I pass it back to the panel in the same order of appearance. Elisa, you could go first. Okay, so concerning the regional aspect, whether it is integrated in the EU, uh, in this new strategic approach, actually what, it is, what is uh, fascinating in this new approach and also at the same time challenging is that it is about a multi-stakeholder and multi-level cooperation. So from the moment when you are starting to look at culture in a wider sense, and you start to look at a bottom-up approach, this idea of connecting people, then you multiply the actors that are taking part and that are an actor uh, in this area. So artists that are doing an artist in residence become actors. Scientists that are working together across borders on 
research projects become actors as well, and so forth, so forth. So uh, regions are one of the actors that are involved in that, and specifically the joint communication is asking for all actors to join forces and to be aware that they are playing and can play an active role in this uh, creation of links, in the strengthening of cultural relations. So that is very important to bear in mind because I don't think that uh, with this myriad of uh, players, they are all aware that what they are doing in their daily lives, it is having an influence in how these relationships are taking shape. So I think that was my, my point. And in terms of um, culture as influence, I think you mentioned, you mentioned that. I think you would want yeah, to take yeah, yeah. that so, point. Okay, I'll give you then the... No? no? So in, in my case, I was not speaking of culture as influence. I was speaking about connecting people, about this bottom-up approach. We were not... When you read the joint communication, the idea is not to have someone in Brussels designing a great strategy to work together with Latin America. What I was mentioning and the language I was using is about working together. So there is a difference between knowing someone and understanding someone. You can approach culture as a way to influence you. And that's the argument for soft power, that you try to increase your attractiveness by showing the best of your culture or the best of your nation or the best of your region. That's one way of looking at culture. Another way of looking at cultures or culture is using it to connect people. If you are looking at culture in this way, you're aiming at building trust and understanding. And it may look paradoxical, but this in the long term is also going to contribute to have closer relationships with other areas. It's not either or, it's just, if you look at it as a line, it's two different parts of the line and there is not no, uh, no cutting uh, edge there in, that separates them very clearly. But the approach that we are advocating now and that the EU institutions are pushing for is this, uh, this approach of bottom-up, people-to-people contact, contact, working together. Thank you very much, Elisa. Anne? Yes, thank you. Uh, I think the question that you had uh, first to me was um, regarding what happens with the people that have received perhaps a fellowship and um, do not want to get back to their countries or where do they go to and if they are from Latin America. Um, and I think um, I, I would like to, to uh, link this to what has been said just uh, re uh, before um, about connecting people uh, in the case of our foundation and I think uh, several other actors are also um, thinking of maintaining a sustainable relationship with the people that they have uh, um, fostered is to maintain a, a, long, uh, a lifelong um, continuity. So we do not hand out a check, but we have uh, uh, re return fellowships also to Cuba uh, and other Latin American countries. The people are using this, but it's not uh, restricted to one region in the world. It's uh, to a group of countries like um, developing and emerging economies, developing countries and emerging economies, so the industrialized world does not receive this sort of extra uh, um, possibility of getting back to his or her uh, home country. And I think that is something that sometimes in, in Latin America is not in place yet. So there, there are a lot of uh, fellowship programs for PhDs or for postdocs, not so many, but for PhD a lot. Um, and what do these PhDs go back to when they return from a, a fellowship in, in Europe or where the, wherever? If they do not have a contract beforehand, then they have a PhD and they, and, and they want to go to industry. And industry is sometimes, excuse me if I put it into very crude words, uh, I, I'm, I have a PhD in literature and, and people from industry in Chile asked me if, which kind of med medical doctor I am. So there's something uh, lacking also in, in, in the community still, even though it has improved and there are policies, but where do these people return to? So, uh, and, and uh, yeah, what do the countries do to integrate them later? Their networks to, to bring them back, 
Uh, Colombia has a very w powerful uh, network that is working uh, rather good. I think uh, Argentina is also doing a lot to, to maintain contact to the Argentinian researchers, I'm talking about researchers mainly, that are in Europe or wherever in the world and they are trying to, to, to maintain these, these links. But it is also an effort on the other side. So I think this is something that, that perhaps could, take, uh, to be, could be taken more into account. Um, but uh, then there's still the, the question of brain circulation, brain drain, and uh, now I learned as well about uh, cultural circulation. So I think circulation is perhaps uh, the thing that, that is uh, helpful to not to see it as, as a one-way uh, yeah, thing, but, but it is in different um, di directions and uh, a circulation and some... I'm German, but I, I grew up in Chile, and I will go back to Chile someday, because there, there's my, 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 the people from the school. They are not in Germany. So uh, th these, these sim single personal aspects are very important for, for bringing these, these, these uh, communities together, and um, they make the difference. The framework helps them, but and, and the, the investment is important as well. But I think um, also the languages that were mentioned are important in this. And I do not see so many efforts in Latin America to foster something else than English. In Europe, there is something in place. I don't know whether it's better, but um, that is also an aspect. No? It was said that Spanish is the most powerful language. I, I will not <laughs> say anything against that. But Brazil, uh, Portuguese in Latin America is not used apart from Brazil. There's n almost nobody I know in, in Chile who speaks Portuguese. And, and, there's also almost nobody in Argentina I know, um, but they cooperate with the people in, 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 in Brazil. So that's also an issue in the region. No? Yeah. Just <laughs> a little add-up. I think in Germany, as in other parts of Europe, Spanish is actually replacing French as the second language of instruction in the schools, which adds to your point. Well, very briefly, and you, uh, Bert, will help me if I'm forgetting something. I, I would like just to to do a couple of uh, yeah, <laughs> do my best. Uh, from the question of the colleague of Hungary, I would like to well, m my first goal will will will, will be uh, keep Erasmus alive, our Erasmus, okay. Um, and after that, I will just want to to highlight uh, to you the existence of a program of Ibero-American academic mobility called the PIMA, uh, which has been uh, put in, in force by the Ibero-American community in 2016. Uh, last year, 44,000 students had this mobility, intra-mobility in Latin America, and the objective for 2020 will be 200,000 students. Let's see if we are able to do it. I mean, uh, what they have done with the PIMA is to replicate, uh, they call it the Erasmus, the Latin American Erasmus, in fact, nobody calls it PIMA, and, um, and they try to do the same thing. It will be really great to try to, to, to keep in touch or to try to, to cooperate with these both programs. Uh, thank you for the idea. And uh, about two of the, of the words of my slides in, uh, well, first, um, culture is influence. Uh, what I wanted to point out in this, in this slide was the difficulty of um, coordinate from a supranational level a culture which is now driven by two paradigm, paradigm, paradigms, which are culture is influence and culture is growth. And this is important for nations. So when you are combining, and Elisa knows a lot about it, uh, and when you are trying to combine, uh, for instance, uh, national institutes, you are in fact combining the efforts of each one of states to project and to promote and to, uh, uh, and to stimulate their interest in the, in the world. I mean, um, you can cooperate with that, of course, and we have a very, very powerful and interesting framework for that, because I, the communication of Mogherini, uh, the 2016 uh, text of Mogherini, is really, really very brave, very uh, courageous, and uh, is very explicit in the way the European Union wants to do that. But the point of, the starting point we are fi finding right now is that culture is driven by the level of states 
with these two main uh, drivers, if you want, uh, politics of influence and politics of economic growth. And second part of your question, uh, is there a fragmented structure of integration in Latin America? No doubt of it. No doubt of it. I mean, you can, you can, you cannot do well. You, you cannot share my opinion, but uh, we are now say, uh, seeing how all structures in the 90s uh, are in, in in danger. We are thinking that they can disappear. Things like Mercosur, one of the most important structures in integration in Latin America, is in a real danger of, of existence, and probably the structures of new integration in Latin America seems to be weaker than the ones put in, in place in the 90s. Uh, but this is my interpretation the of it. points are clear, I think. Of course. Thank you very much. Okay. Elisa wanted to add just, just, one just one sentence from Elisa. Yeah, um, because you ex specifically referred to UNIQ, uh, that that was like the addition of the efforts of the members. It's, it's more than that. It's, and I was insisting on the fact that uh, the approach that we are taking, and that's the added value as well of the network, is to go beyond that and to create something new. Of course, you need the different approaches of the member states, but the idea is to work together among ourselves and especially with local stakeholders and start with this approach that is proposed at the indigenous communication, cultural relations, uh, understanding culture as a space for discussion and understanding. That's it. Okay, to close, just three quick points from my side. First, thank you to the panelists. Also, thank you to Mr. Duran and to all of you. I think what the panel has reminded us of is that we are speaking not only about two regions but about people, connecting people, working with and for the people. The second point that migration, the past migration patterns and current migration is really a key substance of our relation and if we add migration and cooperation we really could think of intertwined biographies. I mean, you put your personal point to it, but I think that is one of the big chances we have between Europe and Latin America that we really get into, into biographies on both sides of the Atlantic. And the third takeaway is Mr. Mr. Duran reminded us of the food and gastronomic heritage are also very important, and with that I would open the lunch break. Thank you very much.